So there's an ancient and anonymous adage that says it's very difficult to find a black cat in a dark room, especially when there is no cat. It seems to me this is a perfect definition of science. This is how science actually progresses. We bumble around in dark rooms looking for cats of a dark color that may or may not be there. Um, I know that many people think otherwise. They believe that science is, a, is an orderly, rule-based activity based on the scientific method, a brotherhood of, of us who follow these rules very carefully. But in point of fact, it's mostly this. And it's mostly this in the dark. <laughs> so the difference between the way science is perceived and the way I recognize that it's pursued first became apparent to me in my kind of dual role at Columbia University where I'm both a professor and run a laboratory that studies the brain and in particular the sense of olfaction. And I noticed that, that in the laboratory, I guess we get rid of that for, for the moment, uh, in the laboratory, working with graduate students and postdocs, thinking up experiments and doing the experiments and thinking about the data, trying to understand how the brain worked, how the sense of smell worked, was fascinating. It got me in early in the morning, kept me there late at night. It was immensely interesting, a pleasure to do, and it was, well, frankly, exhilarating somehow or another. At the same time, I taught a course called, uh, with the forbidding title, Cellular and Molecular Neuroscience One. Um, to a group of undergraduates. Now, this was also an interesting challenge because there's a lot of information that had to be put into 25 fact-packed lectures, and I had to organize all this. So it was quite interesting, but I have to admit, it wasn't exhilarating. So what was the difference, I wondered. Now, the course I was and am teaching, Cell and Molecular Neuroscience, uses a, a classic textbook in the field. Yes, The Principles of Neuroscience by three very eminent neuroscientists who are at Columbia, in fact, Eric Kandel, um, Tom Jessel and the late Jimmy Schwartz. Uh, it's a big book. It's 1,414 pages. It weighs in at a hefty seven and a half pounds. Just to give you some idea of what that is, that's actually twice the weight of a human brain. Twice the weight of a human brain. So how could this be, it seemed to me? I, oh, I have another, just, just so you give me another idea about this. So here's a picture of the book on end, I hope. Yes. The big one, of course, is Principles of Neuroscience. That little squirty thing next to it, that's Darwin's Origin of Species. <laughs> so I came to realize, teaching this course, giving these 25 lectures and having the students read this book, that by the end of it, they must have had the idea that indeed everything must be known about the brain. Everything must be known about neuroscience. That's clearly not true. They must also have had the idea, I think, that what we do as scientists is we pick away at it, we come up with a bunch of facts, and then we stick them in encyclopedic books like this and kind of send them off to be whatever they're going to be. And that's not really true either. When I go to a conference, a science conference, and at the end of the day retire to the bar for a couple of beers with my colleagues, we never talk about what we know. We only talk about what we don't know, what we need to find out. What, what's critical to know, what we haven't known and, and, and need to know to get to the next step, and questions of this sort. So it seemed to me this was best encapsulated in a phrase by Marie Curie. This was written in a, second, in a letter to her brother after she gained her second graduate degree, in which she says, one never notices what has been done, one can only see what remains to be done. And I thought, yes, that's it. We're not teaching these students about what remains to be done. That's the crucial thing. We have to teach them what remains to be done. We have to teach them about the ignorance. I thought, finally, I have a subject I might be able to excel in here. <laughs> I must say in passing, this is one of my favorite pictures of Marie Curie because I'm convinced that that glow around her is real <laughs> and not a photographic effect. Um, <laughs> she, it's, it's, this, is, this is a true, that's not true, I don't think. But, but it is true that her papers are still so radioactive, so hot, that they're stored to this day in the Bibliothèque Francaise in a lead-lined concrete room. And if you're a scholar and want to go work on them, you have to put on a radiation hazmat suit, if you can imagine. So, all right, so I began this course called, um, called Ignorance, uh, in which I have uh, members of our faculty, members of our science faculty and other faculties, come and talk to students for a couple of hours on an evening about what it is they don't know what they're working on, why they chose this question as opposed to that question, uh, what wasn't known 20 years ago that is now, what wasn't known 20 years ago that still isn't known, what we'll be able to do if we know this, what we won't be able to do if we don't know that, all of these sorts of questions. And so it's always interesting, I guess, when I have to call a member of the faculty for this course. Um, hello, Albert, I'm teaching a course on ignorance. I think you'd be great. <laughs> 
But once they get over that, they turn out to be quite good. Um, now, I use the word ignorance, of course, to be at least intentionally provocative here, and I don't mean the kind of ignorance that's meant by the most common use of the word. I don't mean, I don't mean the kind of ignorance that's meant, that means simple stupidity, willful stupidity, a callow, sorry, where am I? I went backwards. A callow indifference to facts or data. Uh, the ignorant are unaware, unenlightened, uninformed, <laughs> often occupy elected offices. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I know this is a cheap shot, but I have to tell you, honestly, I spent quite a bit of time thinking about a graphic to cover that part of the talk, and <laughs> this is really it, you know, it was obvious. So, <laughs> so I don't mean that kind of ignorance. What I do mean instead is a kind of ignorance that was first, or not first mentioned, but that, that summed up, I think, beautifully in a quote by James Clerk Wax, Maxwell, perhaps the greatest physicist between uh, Newton and Einstein, in which he says, Thoroughly conscious ignorance is the prelude to every advance in science. So thoroughly conscious ignorance. That's a different kind of ignorance than we normally think of. And this is where science really can be found and where it really works. So let's think about where this ignorance comes from. One way to think about it is what to do about knowledge. Knowledge is a big subject. This was an estimate by something called the Berkeley Institute that in 2002 there were five exabytes of data added to the database. That's this number here. Their estimate, their updated estimate is that by 2012 we'll have 2,500 exabytes of data. And so we all feel rightfully like we're sitting on top of a, some of us get to the top of the pile, most of us are at the bottom of the pile of facts that have been <coughs> accumulated by science. And this is kind of the accumulation model of science, which I'm going to hope to convince you is wrong. Not only have we accumulated all these facts, which makes the whole operation seem quite impregnable, but, <clears throat> but of course it's growing at an alarming rate. So in 2006, there were about 1.3 million scientific journal articles published just in that year. There's a 2.5% yearly growth. So by this year, 2012, we should have about 1.6 million scientific journal articles published. Given a little over half a million uh, minutes in a year, that means there's a brand new paper every minute. <clears throat> I've been talking here for six minutes. We have... Uh, 18 new papers that none of us have read, so it's time to get to work, right? So what do we do about this? Well, <clears throat> would you think I was lying to you if I told you that scientists have solved this problem largely this way? <laughs> we don't really worry about all those facts. Of course, we keep track of them, but every scientist knows that in the end, the facts are actually the most unreliable part of the process. They're the things that change. They're the things that get revised. They're the things that are there temporarily to help us frame, in fact, better questions. So I want to suggest, I, so I say knowledge is a big subject, but I think ignorance then is actually a bigger one and a more interesting one for us to think about. So we have several models of science that are very common and popular that I think are wrong. So I'm going to try and disabuse you of those a little bit. One of them is that scientists are busy patiently piecing together some sort of a puzzle, putting pieces in one after another. I think this model is wrong. First of all, with puzzles, the manufacturer has guaranteed that there's a solution. We don't have any such guarantee. We my opinion, probably don't even have a manufacturer, to tell you the truth. So I don't think the puzzle model works, and it also gives you a sense that things could be finished, and I don't believe that's necessarily the case either. Another common model is that of an onion, that we're unwrapping an onion, we're unraveling something, taking off layer after layer to get to some fundamental kernel of truth, and I don't think that's the case either. I think it's too static an idea, too contained an idea for what science and the scientific effort is. A little prettier, but, but I think still somehow wrong is the notion of an iceberg where only the tip of the iceberg is visible, the vast majority of it remains unknown and invisible to us. Uh, again, I think this model, although attractive, is kind of wrong because it suggests there's something there that we can eventually uncover. Or I guess in the current situation, we could just <laughs> wait for it to melt. Um, <laughs> sorry, that's bad. Uh, so, so I'd say it's really none of those sorts of models because they're all too static. And the one I prefer is a watery model also, but the idea of ripples on a lake. So that as the, as the circle of knowledge increases, so does their circumference increase, that part of it that's in touch with the unknown. So that as knowledge grows, so grows ignorance. And it's really, that's the important thing. Where the action is, is on the outer rim of this ripple on the lake. 
This was caught up, I think, in a wonderful phrase by George Bernard Shaw. This is actually a toast from George Bernard Shaw to Albert Einstein at a dinner celebrating Einstein's work in which he said, science is always wrong. It never solves a problem without creating 10 more, which I just think is glorious. I just think that's a wonderful idea, which, by the way, it turns out he cribbed from Immanuel Kant, who had said something about 100 years earlier, very similar. He talked about a principle of question propagation in which every answer on principle begets, every experience begets a new question. Of course, Shaw in his inimitable way raised the stakes by an order of magnitude, but I think he was probably right about that as well. So this is the idea that in fact the answers create questions. So we may think commonly that we begin with ignorance and we gain knowledge somehow or another, but I would like to suggest to you that the more critical step in the process is the reverse of that. That what we do with knowledge is gain better ignorance. We find higher quality ignorance from lower quality ignorance. We frame better questions and we come up with better, um, better um, programs for finding the answers to those questions, which only, of course, lead to further questions. Yes, it's a double-sided arrow, I'm sure, and it works both ways, but I'd like to suggest that the important way is really generating ignorance. All right, so, so the only problem with this, or a problem with this, that I hope you've thought about a little bit and I'm gonna tell you about anyway, is that this suggests that science then, the values of science are ignorance, doubt, and uncertainty, which doesn't sound like a very saleable product, especially for those of us on grants or who worry about things like climate change, tobacco issues, things of this nature. So, so let's talk about the difference between ignorance and, um, and something that's somehow or another unreliable. All right, science progress, scientific progress generates ignorance, so one question is, does ignorance equal uncertainty? Does uncertainty equal doubt? Does science create uncertainty and doubt? Well, the answer, I think, is a resounding yes, it does. But, but, the crucial distinction to make here is that uncertainty is not equivalent to unreliability. That unsettled science is not unsound science. And this is a crucial idea to get in one's head. It's very difficult for us to do so. Uh, I use this as an example. I've actually stole this from a colleague of mine, David Halfand, an astronomer, who talks about the development of how we think about weather from the primitive to the scientific. So primitive humans might have, in the middle of a storm, like I just came out of in New York, said, the wind is angry. Um, a slightly more sophisticated, not much more, but a slightly more sophisticated idea might be that the wind god is angry, let's sacrifice a couple of virgins and see how that goes. <laughs> so, but the more scientific, the more modern explanation is the wind is a measurable, if currently unpredictable, form of energy. Now, I would say to you that the first two of those statements are a complete and total explanation. They're complete and total bullshit, but they're complete and total explanation as well, and satisfying as an explanation. The third, of course, is not an explanation, but it tells us where to go and what we may yet find out, and it gives us a program to find these things out. So I'll quote Erwin Schrodinger here, a great physicist and I think philosopher as well, who said, in an honest search for knowledge, you quite often have to abide by ignorance for an indefinite period. Now this causes a problem, though, because Human beings don't like doubt. They don't like uncertainty. I believe as a neuroscientist, our brain was not built for uncertainty. It was built for certainty. If you see spots over there on the forest floor, you really don't want to worry about whether that's sunshine through dappled leaves or a leopard. You just kind of get the hell out of there. So you make a very quick decision about it. And this can be seen, I'm going to give you an example of it that we can all do as an experiment in, in a set of illusions that are known as typically as ambiguous figures and why it's so difficult for us to keep uncertainty in our head and work with it. So here's a very famous illusion. Uh, I've got this, this particular one is a cartoon in The New Yorker. The beautiful woman turning her head to the other woman says, I'm, I'm turning into my mother because you can also look at it this way. So she can also be the profile of an ugly old hag. And you can now see it either way, so you can flip back and forth and see it both ways. So you can see the ambiguity in the figure, but note that you can never see both things at once. You never ever see both solutions at once. Another example of this is something, a famous illusion called the Necker cube. Amazing to begin with because we see a three-dimensional cube when there's really nothing there but lines on a two-dimensional flat surface. But at different points, you'll see that cube pointing into or out of the screen or up or down or down to the left and up to the right. Sometimes if you fill one in, you see it flip back and forth. But in any case, you can watch this thing for a while and watch it flip back and forth, but you'll never ever find a transitional moment. 
In fact, the most striking example of this is something that I uncovered, believe it or not, in, the, in a weird little magic museum in the basement of an old building in the Marais district of Paris. And I saw this demonstration. So this is just an iPhone movie. It's not going to be high quality. But as you can see, it's called The Two Brothers, Les Deux Frères. And um, so you'll see what happens when this wheel turns very slowly. Keep your eye on the, keep your eye on the wheel, not on me. You see that quite suddenly, no matter how slowly you turn that wheel, the transition from one face to another is nonetheless immediate. You never see two faces at once in there. And so this is just a question of the equipment that we're working with and the fact that it's difficult to work with uncertainty, but we have to learn to do it because it's crucial. So the values of science are not, I think, as is often thought, fact, surety, and conviction, or what the newspaper would have you believe. It is rather, in fact, ignorance, doubt, and uncertainty all the way down, I'm sorry to say. Um, so I'll end this with, uh, with Schrodinger's quote again. In an honest search for knowledge, you quite often have to abide by ignorance for an indefinite period of time. There's a man who knew about abiding by ignorance for indefinite periods of time. He had the famous black cat in a Schrodinger's box, which you never knew whether it was dead or alive and until you actually opened the box, one of the great conundrums of, of the quantum physical world. And finally, uh, a quote by... Um, by Vaclav Havel, who, which you probably stole from Andre Gide, but I think nonetheless is very important. Keep the company of those who seek the truth, flee from those who claim to have found it. Thank you very much.